but makes it real. It's the detail that points to what where the song what the song means. And if you listen to you song, which we might do spirit we might do Spirit of the Land, because um, that's a that's a really good example of 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 detail and reality. Um, and oh, I was gonna say, Two things there was the, uh, the detail which I wanted to reiterate, and now I see the other bit's gone. Don't mind. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, well, Should I we do Spirit of the Lamb? I think that's finished. Bridges. Can we, can we just finish? Finish Bridges. Bridges musically, for those not really well versed in music, we don't know a hell of a lot about chord progressions or whatever. A bridge usually ta is a contrasting set of chords. It's different chords. You might change key. You might just, if you're in a major key, you might make your bridge a, a minor thing. I, I can best illustrate this. Can I just do a real quick thing? With just, um, I, I'm, it's most, it's best illustrated in jazz because in or the, the classic American songbook songs. And if you've got um, no one to talk with all by myself, no one to walk with, but I'm happy on the shelf. Ain't misbehaving, saving all my love for you. Okay, you with me? Yep. Repeat it. I don't go out late, no place to go. Home about it, just me and my radio. Ain't misbehaving, saving all my love for you. Okay, we've repeated that. I'm sick of that. Like Jack Horner in the corner. Don't go nowhere, what do I care? Your kisses aren't worth waiting for. That lovely contrast. Believe me, darling. I don't know for certain the one I love, etc. Right, and that's a perfect illustration of what a functionally what a bridge does, and that will work in every, not every song, but many, many songs. But there are many structures of songs too. There's the English folk form that Bob Dylan employed spectacularly for much of his career, which is just four lines repeated, really. You know, all those songs, Masters of War, and all that yeah. classic yeah. English yeah. folk song structure. But there are many structures that that ain't misbehaving is the A-A-B-A -A -A structure. Idea, reiteration, contrast, reaffirmation kind of thing of your idea. And that The way I do it, the way I structure it up if I'm going to write a song and I don't know how, you know, like I'm building it and I've got an idea and a verse and a chorus and I don't know what I'm going to do, I go, okay, so I need an intro, uh, I need something to get into the song, I need a verse, I need a chorus, I need a bridge or a middle eight, I need, you know, so I've got the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus, outro, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus, chorus, outro. And if you listen to a lot of our songs, you will find to a greater or lesser extent, they will take that kind of form because it is, you know, it's robust, uh, it's, it's, it's proven, um, uh, it's, it, it's easy, it's, you know, the, these are the building blocks. You've got a road map to where you're going, and uh, uh, you know, as I said, you'll you'll be halfway to you know the areas before you know <laughs> what you're doing. So does bridging work better in particular places? Yeah. Uh, for me, for me, for me, it's like you know you, you establish the verse and the chorus so that that's in everybody's head. And as Hugh said, when when he, when everybody's just beginning to get a little bit bored by that, turn left, turn right, do a U turn. Shine a different light on the subject. Oh, that's what I was going to say about perspectives. Lyrics are the, often the hardest thing. I don't know. All those who find tunes hard to write, say I. <laughs> All those who find lyrics hard to write, say I. Okay, there's more eyes for the lyric, okay? Um, Hugh, was, I use this image sometimes that might be helpful is, is, a, a, um, is a helicopter, um, uh, like, a, like a camera in a chop, chopper. You, you start off you start off down on the detail and once you've established what the story is, what the characters are in, in their context, then you get the ch chopper pot pilot to go higher and you open up the lens and you put that story in the big broader context. Listen, why don't we do, having spoken about all of this, why don't we do a Spirit of the Land? Because I think that's a really good example. Yeah, I've got one Oh, jeez. <laughs> no, I don't want to do Spirit of the Land anymore. No. I'm over it. No. Final, final thing to say. Yeah. Cringe lines. Yeah. Do we know what cringe yeah. lines yeah. are? Have, who's written the cringe line? Yeah. Every no. second one. <laughs> who's written the cringe line? Yeah. Best thing with your mates, never tell them what the cringe line is in their song. 
<laughs> and, and if they tell you what it is, just tell them to get fucked. <laughs> and, and, and anyway... Here's cringe lines in Diamantina Drover. Oh. <laughs> I like Diamantina Drover, isn't it? Oh, so, you get over your own cringe lines. It's like, you, know, you get over your small penis. <laughs> 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 Yes. Um, see, with him, see, no, when you write it, you have really got to gotta get him away from the dick thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just acknowledging, trying to acknowledge him and, and getting you guys to acknowledge it. We're all going to write cringe so lines. Is it the heck yeah. rhyme or...? Oh, it can be all of those things. It can be... Is it, it a Casey it, Chambers it, type? Well, it can be just a, a poorly she expressed thought. But, you know, you'll, you'll know, and sometimes you can, over, you can overwrite things in, until you try and get rid of a cringe line and you've completely screwed yourself but up. But don't, so. but don't... Don't actually go away from the cl cliches and what you think are cringe lines, because what you might think is a cringe line may not be. And I'll tell you who is a guy who is the past master at stringing together cliches and very well-travelled phrases and images. And we love this guy. He's a really good friend of ours, and I think he's a major talent. I think he's a major unsung ta talent, and it makes my heart bleed when I see Paul Kelly. Everybody genuflex about Paul okay. Kelly, and, we, and I, I'm over Paul Kelly. But this guy, <laughs> this other guy, who I'm about to, to give the name to, is absolutely fantastic. He is, and he should be a major figure in this musical landscape. And in fact, he is. He is. Shane Howard. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You think about Shane, you know, you... You, know. Yeah. you just, you, you, you think about that, you, you go and listen to his songs and then go, and I go and underline all the cliches and you'll find millions of them. But Shane has that brilliant facility, which I don't have, to string these things together in the, in the way that they sound immediately fresh and accessible and familiar and powerful and evocative, but he's using phrases and words that we use all the time. So, you know, Shane is the great, but yeah, there are cringe lines and yeah, we've, we've, we've all written them, um, you know, but don't let a cringe line stop you because it didn't stop Shane Howard. And, you know, that guy's a, a major poet in this country, in my view. <laughs> Right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, you, you know... Got a letter from Davey. Mm. Who'll ever forget that? Mm. I mean, solid rock, living on borrowed right. ground, standing on, you know, winds yeah. of change are blowing down the time. I mean, it's cliche after cliche after <laughs> cliche, and it's a major, major hit. And it actually was one of the songs that changed the way, in lots of ways, changed the way we look at Indigenous Australia. Yeah. You know, way back then, I mean, he just nailed it. You know, saw the white sails in the sun. You know, it wasn't long before they heard of, you know, white law, white man, like gun. Don't tell me that it's justified someone somewhere lied. You know, like bang, the whole world went, wow, right, got it, you know? And, uh, and, and, and you know why it was so pow powerful? Great tune, great band. Shane's got a really distinctive voice, all of that stuff. But cliche after cliche after cl cliche. So, you know. So are we going to do this thing or are you going to talk? Call <laughs> yeah. me to fucking sob. <laughs> <laughs> Rivers are dry across the land The farmer's fields have turned to sand Cause the rain hasn't come for two years Almost three The topsoil's gone with a hot north wind The crops won't grow Rust set in and the cool south wind of winter Brought no relief And the old Bar talk of floods and droughts before The light goes on, the conversations die But the battlers don't give up It's written on their hands and their eyes The spirit of the land survives on Saturday nights at the Royal Hotel Hank the Dutchman plays guitar Sings country and western favourites and requests It used to be his second job A bit of a laugh for a couple of bob Now it's all he's got Cause his crops all died he first So he brought it from the back of the 
Cookies bad, but the cookies all shop in town for kings of dream. And we all fed in a public bottle with mugs and crowds before. The night goes on and the conversation die. But the battlers don't give up. It's written on the hand. The schools all run down, the roofs rusted and the paints peeling, the playgrounds just a dust bowl, not a spot of green. The kids still kick their footballs, sending dust clouds to the sun. And it's good to know the drought can't spoil the fun. And the cricketers lounge late at night, where the cockies talk, the shearers fight, their wives drink shandies because they'll be driving home. The talk centers round the price of wheat. The lack of rain and the lack of sleep The grid stretched and it won't stretch anymore And the old man in the public bar Talking bugs and rounds before The night goes on and the conversations die But the battlers don't give up It's return on the hand Thank you. We have a find a pair. Ten past eleven. Ten past ten. ten, past ten. No, no, we, we got we got to leave it out of ten. Okay, cool. We're still going. Sorry. Uh, right uh, no, how long we got? Half past ten. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's all right. So, um, <coughs> questions. Yes. Okay. Is there anything I can't imagine myself that you would definitely not put in? Sorry. Is there anything that you would definitely not put in an S bomb? Uh, probably the C bomb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would. What? I would. I'd celebrate it. Okay. I would. I couldn't give a fuck. I'd use it if I felt like it. Oh, um, yeah. um, no, no. Really, it's about. It's really about you know what you think you can get away with at a particular time point in place. in time. That's but right. there, I think I think there are some things that you should really be careful about, right? For instance. Be very cautious if you're trying to write the write about the lives of other people. And a lot of people, I hear a lot of very poor songs written about Indigenous issues by white fellas trying to write about black fellas. And it can be done. Shane Howard is, is a great expert at it, really. Uh, but there, there's a trap that I, I hear people falling into. You know, they really have the right, their heart's in the right place, they want to empathise, but they're writing about something they really don't know anything about. And all you know, all the reading of you know, the newspapers and everything doesn't alter that fact. You, you, there's something you just got to live. I think. Um, yeah, I think lived all, experience is is, yeah. is absolutely important. I mean, when you uh, when you think about the songs that w that we've written that have been you know moderately successful, um, they are either our own experience, like Spirit of the Land, Borrowed Ground. I wrote a song for my son when I missed him, called For the Children. Um, uh, you know, story songs that we, you know, to a greater extent, we are, are, are either, you know, in the firelight or dancing on the edges of the firelight, or 
we have worked really, really hard with somebody like I did when I wrote I was only 19 to really get inside their heads and walk around inside their skin, inside their boots, look out their eyes and use the songwriter poet's imagination to, to, to really get inside it, you know. But when you start to write things from your imagination or a newspaper report or whatever else, unless you've got some lived experience to grab hold of, it's going to be shit out. And so to answer your question, I wouldn't be writing something that I didn't have any experience of. I mean, just to, I mean not to, to talk incessantly about 19, but I always wanted to write a song about uh, um, the uh, Australian soldiers in Vietnam. And then um, uh, Don wrote K San, which I thought was brilliant, you know. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, that's it. That, that's that one gone. He's nailed that. Thanks very much. Don, next time I see you, I'll kick you in the kneecap. Um, and then I met Mick Storham, who was a Vietnam veteran, who stepped out of what was then the very closed circle of Vietnam veterans and told me his story. And I interviewed him really hard and I, you know, taped the conversations and I pressed him for the detail. What were the tents like? What did they look like? <laughs> What was, what did it smell like? How did you feel? You know, what, what did your mum think? What did your dad think? You know, what was going on when the mine hit? You know, what happened? How did, what happened then? You know, and, and it got to the point where actually I was, I was close enough to Mick as a mate and understood the trust that he, he, he exhibited by stepping out of the circle uh, and telling me his story. And because I had the empathy, because it could have been me, and I'd imagined it in my head, I put the songwriters and the poet's sensibility in with a, a, a real story, um, my own um, uh, uh, passion and, and sympathy and empathy for these blokes, put them all in a pot, you know, and bang, out came I was only 19. But I wasn't going to write a song about I was uh, about Vietnam I, after Don, because I wasn't going to do it based on what I remember from, you know, the television reports at the time and things I was re reading in the newspapers at the time. I actually made a conscious decision not to, even though I wanted to. So it was when Mick told me his story that the door opened and I went into a different world and could take his story, bring it outside the room in a way that validated him and his mates and was actually real. And once again, as Huey said, the detail, the detail in 19 is the thing that absolutely nails it to the wall. And perhaps in some ways, when you're thinking about it, separates it a bit from k -San because I'm talking about the really... Person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and k -San is a song written largely... Yeah, a great song. Great, don't get me wrong, great song. But largely written, from what I understand, imagination and... And all yeah. that stuff. But, and if, you, if your detail's wrong, so John, I know, I, I've heard John talk about this before, and he really researched that detail. He got, he got it right. You know, and when you hear Vietnam veterans um, reflecting on that song, they always say he got it right. All the details are right. You hear no disputes about it. It wasn't, oh, you know, I, well, when I came to the tomb, there was one angel. Hang on, no, there were two angels in Mark, and there were three in. Matthew, no, it wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. How, did, how did I get onto a critique of the New <laughs> Testament? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but the point year. being that if the details are wrong, then the whole story falls apart. Mm. Yes. And um, mm. so, it's the weakest uh, link. You, yeah. you, you, you mentioned, um, you know, you got a lot of shit in the bottom drawer. Do you ever go back and revisit that and revisit yeah, yeah, songs yeah. or pick up threads? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. And a, a, a good example, which you may know, was. Um, uh, I've been to Bali too. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, well, I lived in, in Ubud for, <clears throat> uh, well, when I left university, I, I, I finished and I had about four months before I started work and I went to Indonesia, had no money at all. And I ended up in Ubud um, before there was power, before there was running water. It, uh, it, was, a, it was an artist village and at four o'clock, Whatever visitors from Sanur or Kuda were there, they all got in a bus and went home and there were probably five or six Europeans who actually were in the village and I was one. And I established relationships with some guys, a guy that Hugh, Hugh and I both know is a very dear friend to this day, to this day. Um, and I, they were, in those days, they were all bemused by the tourists. Uh, they thought they were nuts, you know. And I, there was a guitar there, it was a really cheap, shitty old guitar at the place I was staying at and I asked the guy if I could 
I uh, turned the strings around and play left hand and he said yeah and I, I wrote this song I just I can't remember I, I um that was in a, uh, I'm just trying to Welcome. I came in from Java by third class train I reached Den Pasar in the tropical rain and I got the Bali I got the Bali blues <laughs> I got no news from home, I'm all alone, I really got the barley blue. Well I hustled out the coot of the moment, I've arrived, so fucking tired, I'm sorry I'm alive, and I got the barley, I got the barley blues. I got no news from home, I'm all alone, I really got the barley. Well I was hustled out the moment, I say, so, so. That was the song, and I wrote it for the boys in Bali because it was a piss take of the tourists. They thought it was just hysterical, and everywhere I went in, it was a millstone around my neck because everywhere <laughs> I went in Ubud for years afterwards, oh, John, Bali blues! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and every time there was a guitar anywhere near me, I had to play Bali blues, and they all sat around and thought it was amazing because it basically it was a piss take of all these you know, tourists, and I considered that I wasn't one because I'd been pulled out of the tourist mainstream and I was in this little society of, as I discovered, to my sort of amazement, we're all Balinese princes, you know, so <laughs> I was just oh. hanging around with these guys for months. Um, so anyway, when we were doing Frontline, um, we were a bit short of songs, and I told Trevor Lucas, the producer, that I, I, I'd written I'd written all my songs for the album and I'd bring them along to the sessions and all that stuff. And it was all bullshit. I had a couple, but I didn't, I was one short. And <laughs> bottom drawer, absolutely bottom drawer. I was going through the things and I pulled out this cassette that I'd done. I said, oh, Bali Blues. <laughs> Fuck, I reckon I could do something with that. <laughs> so I pulled it out and we wrote, you know, the, the uh, song that we know now. Um, and there it was. I mean, I re, re structured it. And, you know, and then we had a uh, bass player playing yeah, in Red Gum at the time called Steve Kearn, a fabulous Irish musician. Um, he was just extraordinary. Inordinate, and he was, inordinately creative musician. Oh, yeah. It he just, had just ideas was flowing out of him. And he was deep into reggae at that time. And we are a kind of like a folk rock band. <laughs> and he started playing that <laughs> bass yeah, line. It, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 so it was South, it's South if he wanted to do. <laughs> So, because we've got to have the reggae chuk chuk yeah. So it ended up being a reggae song. And then the, the bass line. Because I remember him and Michael Atkinson sitting out in the in another studio playing um, a, a Bob Marley song, Is This Love, Is This Love, or something, one of those things, which had an ama similar but amazing bass line. The, the bass line drove the song, you know. It was very, um, yes, uh, quirky bass line. But anyway, the bass line for Bali was... <laughs> Twenty ten passar, meals and a cop, rent a car. I've been to Bali, I've been to Bali.